All right. Uh, welcome to all, uh, and thank you for being here at the Freedom to Learn in Historical Perspective, a webinar uh, run by uh, a partnership of Pan America, a uh, hundred year old free speech organization, uh, and Made by History, an independent uh, editorial section of the Washington Post. Uh, I'm Jeremy Young, Senior Manager of Free Expression and Education here at Pan America. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors uh, for this event, uh, particularly Lumina Foundation, uh, who generally sponsor, generously sponsored this webinar, uh, as well as the Henry Luce Foundation and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Uh, we're here to talk today about uh, the freedom to learn, uh, uh, which is two things. Uh, it, first, it is a central concern of educators and of Americans uh, at this very challenging time in our history. And second, uh, it is the name of a series uh, of 10, what will soon be 10 essays uh, published by Made by History, uh, their section in the Washington Post. 10 essays by prominent historians talking about uh, the history of uh, free expression in the classroom, in education, the history of academic freedom, of shared governance, uh, and of free speech. Uh, and this is a series that uh, Pan America has sponsored over the past uh, couple of months. Uh, eight of the 10 pieces have now been published. Uh, two, the next two are coming uh, on, on Monday of next week and the week after that, uh, and that will conclude the series. Uh, and we're so very lucky to have with us today both uh, a, a, a number of the authors uh, from this series, although we weren't able to accommodate all of them, and also uh, Diana D'Amico Polowitz, uh, who is the series editor for Made by History. So I want to introduce everyone briefly, uh, and then uh, our sequence of events will be today will be Diana and I will speak a little bit about the series, how it came to, to be, um, what the, what her sort of editorial vision for the series was. Uh, and then uh, I will hop off and you won't see me anymore. And uh, then Diana will lead a, a, a panel discussion of the uh, the authors who are here uh, with us from the series. And uh, finally, there will be time at the end uh, for uh, question and answers. Um, so first, let me introduce everyone. Uh, Diana D'Amico Polowitz, uh, sorry, Diana D'Amico Polowitz, I knew I was going to mispronounce your name, even after you told me how to pronounce it right, sorry about that, uh, is a historian of education policy and reform and an associate professor at the University of North Dakota and a visiting scholar at the University of Richmond's Bonner School for Civic Engagement. Uh, she's an editor at the Washington Post Made by History section where she was, she served as series editor for the Freedom to Learn series. Uh, and her scholarship explores uh, school reform and the ways education policies and practices have both disrupted and uh, supported broader fights for equity. She is the author of Blaming Teachers, Professional Policy, Professionalization Policies, and the Failure of Reform in American History, and the editor of Walkout, Teacher Activism, Militancy, and School Reform. And her writing has appeared in national newspapers and academic outlets. And uh, our other uh, panelists who will uh, be joining us uh, in just a moment, uh, Eddie Cole is Associate Professor of Higher Education and History at UCLA and the author of the multi-award winning book, The Campus Color Line, College Presidents and the Struggle for Black Freedom, uh, which came out from Princeton University Press in 2020. Dr. Cole has received national recognition for his scholarship on college presidents and race, including being named in Education Week as one of the most influential US education scholars, the 2018 Early Career Award from the Association for the Study of Higher Education, the 2017 Mellon Emergence, Emerging Faculty Leaders Award from the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, and a 2015 National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. Karen Graves is Professor Emerita at Denison University, a former president of the History of Education Society USA. She is the author of And They Were Wonderful Teachers, Florida's Purge of Gay and Lesbian Teachers. Her latest publication is Mad River, Marjorie Rowland, and the Quest for LGBT Teachers' Rights, co-authored with Margaret A. Nash, who also co-authored uh, Dr. Graves' uh, forthcoming essay uh, in the Made by History series. Ed Larson 
holds the Hugh and Hazel Darling Chair in Law and is University President of History. Sorry, University Professor of History. Uh, just gave him a new job title at uh, Pepperdine uh, University. Originally from Ohio with a PhD in the history of science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a law degree from Harvard, Larson lectured on all seven continents in one memorable but exhausting year and has taught at Yale University, Stanford Law School, University of Melbourne, Leiden University, University of Richmond, and the University of Georgia, where he chaired the history department. Prior to becoming a professor, Larson practiced law in Seattle and served as counsel for the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, recipient of the Pulitzer Prize in History and numerous other awards for writing and teaching, Larson is the author of 15 books and over 100 published articles appearing in such diverse places as Nature, Atlantic Monthly, and Virginia Law Review. Finally, Donna Perillo is an education historian and a professor of English education at the University of Texas of El Paso. Uh, her scholarship focuses on the history of schools and citizenship, both in the sense of how schools define and translate citizenship values and how they enfranchise or disenfranchise students and teachers. She is the author of two books, Uncivil Rights, Teachers, Unions, and the Battle for School Equity, and Educating the Enemy, Teachers Teaching Nazis and Mexicans in the Cold War Borderlands. Her work has also appeared in the Washington Post, the Boston Review, Education Week, El Paso Matters, and Time Magazine. So these are the folks you're about to hear uh, in a moment. Uh, and first, um, I want to want to welcome uh, Diana uh, to talk a little bit about this series. Um, Diana, tell us a little bit about how this series came to be uh, at Made by History, the Freedom to Learn series. Yeah, well, you know, Jeremy, I think for that, and it's so great to be here, and I'm just excited to be with all of you. But um, I think a lot of those initial creative building blocks for this project were laid early on between you and our Phenomenal, one of my phenomenal colleagues and co-editors, our senior editor at Made by History, which is Katie Bruno. Um, I think that together you really kind of dreamed up what this could be and set the framework for it. Um, Katie's work is just exceptional and really does center in this space too. She has a new book called Cable America. Uh, she's at Purdue University. And for those of you thinking about doctoral studies, look at Katie. Um, but I think that there was sort of, so the two of you, I think, set a vision. And then by the time that I came in, it was really this larger conversation about how can we use this partnership to not just tell one slice of a story, but a larger narrative about how education is being used right now, right? So not a narrow story about what's happening in a classroom or happening with one debate, but what these signify more broadly for American democracy and society historically and today. And so it was really exciting to get to work with all of these great folks, some of them who are here today, um, to, to sort of take these very different takes. And I think one of the things I'm most proud of when we think about the series as a whole is that it's not one note, right? Each has a different take, a different slice of this history, a different voice. And I think when we, and one of the things I'd like to do today is think about, so if we take all these puzzle pieces and think about them together, what, what emerges, how do we make sense <laughs> of where we've been and where we are at this moment? I think you're right. Uh, let me ask a, another question. How how do you you know the the history of uh, threats to educate uh, educational censorship, threats to public education, higher education? How do you decide uh, to tell that story in only ten essays? I mean, couldn't this be a hundred essays, five hundred essays? How how do you how do you pick and choose? What what are the sort of value judgments you made in in, in selecting these authors uh, and these pieces that we we've, we've seen? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, and hey, if we have funding, we can keep this going for decades. Let's just keep it going, right? Um, yeah, but so how did we select these 10? I think that the 10 essays in the series are by scholars who are leading voices in this work, right? So it's a really nice way to take their work out of that sort of academic spaces and bring them into public debate, public spaces. Um, but each has a different kind of perspective. We have essays that think about politics, we have essays that think about parental rights, we have essays that think about the intersection of race and academic freedom. Karen's essay that's going to be running next Monday looks at the, the fights to limit LGBTQ teachers and content and how this has played out over a long period of time. So I think we really wanted to try and get 
um, a variety of voices, but also voices by people who have done really substantial work in this area over a long period of time. Were there particular um, topics that you thought were absolutely essential to cover? Um, were there topics that you, you wish had been covered that, that aren't in the series? You know, how do, how do you select those sort of themes for yeah. the story you're going to tell? Yeah, that's great, Jeremy. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, there's so much more that we could have done. I have to think more. What do I, what would be on my wish list? Um, I mean, I think with a great group of we have, I really did get a lot of what I was hoping and dreaming for. I think there's always more. I would have loved more that looked into these questions of equity and academic freedom. Um, I would have loved more that think about different areas of the, the curriculum. But, but I think that what we have here, like the things that were really important to me were the pieces that thought about these education debates in big ways right? That we're not just thinking about what's happening in the schools, but we're thinking about the schools as politics. We're thinking about public education or these debates about academic freedom as fundamental contests over American democracy. <laughs> and so, so all of these pieces contribute to that vision that public education is more than the schoolhouse, right? That these are, these are cultural debates that play out and they, they take different forms um, and different shapes. And I think that's one of the interesting things that maybe we'll get to in our conversation is that there's not one set story here, right? There's not one's a good guy or bad guy or idea that, you know, yes, academic freedom looks like this <laughs> and, and it always is, uh, always is virtuous in some kind of way. Um, but yeah, for me, it was a sense of the larger significance of these educational debates. That's great. Um, why do you, so this series was, is a particular way of looking at the, the challenges facing education today more broadly in our society. Why is it important for, uh, for readers, uh, for audience members to read historically informed op-eds, uh, editorials on on this? Why, why is that an important perspective that we need? Yeah, I love that question, Jeremy. Thanks for asking it. I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's the, the pitch that we're all making all the time in our classes, in our work, why does this matter? And I think that without the kind of framing that these authors offer, there is this dangerous tendency to fall prey to newness <laughs> and originality. And this is the first time we're seeing these things. And so, you know, so there's no precedence here, right? I think that what we do in Made by History in the Washington Post and what these essays in particular do is they broaden the scope <laughs> for us. They broaden the questions that should be on the table, right? So none of, none of the historians on this panel or in the series I think would uh, would suggest that history offers a policy script, right? Or because this thing happened, then we need to do one, two, and three, right? But I think instead it offers something more powerful, right? It it shapes maybe the way we should see this issue in different light, right? Or the questions that we should ask. And I think that one of the things that these essays do such a good job at bringing to light is how um, certain questions and ways of answering them have preoccupied the debate. Well, what if we take it from a different stance and history, history, historical research and historical framing gives us the ability to see that from a much broader sort of uh, vantage point. Well, thanks for those great answers, Diana. And it's been incredible to partner with you on this series. So I really think it's a it's a it's a feather in the cap of both uh, Made by History and and Pan America as the sponsor. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn things over to Diana now uh, to to conduct a discussion about these the the, the series and the, the question of uh, the freedom to learn and historical perspective with uh, many of the authors in the series. All right, thanks, thanks Jeremy. All right, well now, I mean, not that that wasn't fun. That was fun for me, but now to the really fun part with all of you. Um, it has been such a treat and a joy and really a professional, you know, privilege to work with each of you and so many of the others, all of the others who weren't able to come today um, because there's only so many boxes that feel right on a Zoom screen <laughs> before it just gets loud. Um, but so I think let's start with this because I, I don't think that, um, everybody who's joining us now or everyone who's going to watch the recorded session later 
may have had the chance to read your wonderful essays just yet. So maybe we can start our conversation with each of you giving that kind of brief elevator version of, of what your essay in the series was all about. So I don't, would you like me to call in folks or anybody want to volunteer to go first? All right, well, Karen, you're next and your essay is, is first. You're right near me on my screen and your essay is the next to run. So if you like, maybe you can start us. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the work of PIN America and the Made by History series and I'm delighted to be part of this endeavor. Uh, Margaret Nash and I studied a period when LGBTQ teachers were purged from classrooms. We looked at the continual struggle they have had for em against employment discrimination and the ways in which that history has intersected with attacks on LGBTQ youth and LGBTQ issues in the curriculum. Now, we generally think of attacks on academic freedom as attacks on ideas through the school curriculum. But as we know, all learning in school doesn't come, it's not confined to the school curriculum. So historically, attempts to marginalize LGBTQ community have been focused, and in fact, were first focused on um, not allowing LGBTQ people to be teachers in the classroom. And so these attacks, uh, anti-gay attacks on LGBTQ teachers are attacks on academic freedom because their aim has been to limit and control what students think about sexuality and gender identity. Yeah, well, thanks, Karen. I'm excited for your essay to run on Monday. And, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed with each of the essays is the conversation that's happened after them, right? Like just over social media, people reaching out sometimes with kind and lovely things to say and sometimes not. But um, Eddie, maybe you, would you like to go next to tell us about your essay just a bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and let me echo what Karen just said. It's, it's an honor to be here and great to be part of the series. Uh, a very brief summary of my essay, it really focuses on academic freedom and race and how even though much of the, uh, the, the, the many attempts to limit uh, the truth about history and racism within uh, the United States and education right now, it has grabbed headlines right now, captured attention as if it's something new. But to your earlier point, Diana, uh, the newness of what we're seeing today is simply uh, inaccurate. Uh, these are, are this has been around for so long, and so my argument in my piece ultimately is that many of the most aggressive attempts to limit academic freedom have been race centered, um, and that goes back to in my essay picking up to the where the uh, the AAUP. Um, has its initial 1940 principles around defining academic freedom. In the very next year at the University of Georgia, we see an attempt uh, to limit academic freedom uh, framed within um, you know, an academic dean and their sympathies toward uh, racial equality. And I sort of work my piece from the 1940s through the 50s to the 60s up into the 70s, just to show that what we're seeing today is really a continuation of a long tradition to attack education and really to attack race uh, within education, which really lends to a, a, a really uh, fruitful conversation around what's the purpose of education in the first place and how these attacks are really part of sort of uh, dueling philosophies around education and trying to stifle conversations about race. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Um, how about you, Jonna? Would you like to go next for us? Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks. Um, so, and I want to second everything everyone has said, and also someone who works with a lot of humanities teachers to say thank you, Penn, um, for the work that you do. So my piece compares um, book banning in schools in the McCarthy period and now, and I do actually trace something that I see as kind of a break or a difference, two main differences, really. Um, first, that these McCarthy campaigns um, focus largely on textbooks rather than on literature. Um, and this is important because these were the kind of books that students really only encountered in school. And um, not to say that there isn't a difference in one textbook or another, but I don't think students felt a great deal of stake in what was being censored or which textbook they read, right? Um, that's very different from what's happening now where we see books being banned that are texts that students are, even if they are getting them through their schools, reading for largely for enjoyment. 
Um, and so that's one central difference. Um, this is because of a, a second central difference which um, that I identify, which is the reading curriculum itself. So um, literature books weren't censored by and large by in McCarthy period because the literature that students were reading in school were the same books that their, their own parents had read a generation before. They were classic, they were of course white and really just non-objectionable <laughs> to, um, to censors. Um, that's different now because of the development and popularization of young adult literature in the last 40 to 50 years. Um, and so I see the current attacks as much more of an attack on adolescents' right to read, um, which goes beyond just an attack on the curriculum. Yeah, thank you, Jana. And Ed, would you like to share? Sure. I appreciate everything I've heard because my story uh, is a little bit like that. Um, it talk, It looks at the continuation that what we're seeing now is a continuation of what has happened since the beginning of the public schools, since, um, since uh, man first had the idea of having them back in um, um, the early 1800s. And I look, I have a book on the Scopes trial, uh, the early, and I have another book on the anti-evolution crusades in America. Plus I've also worked on the history wars, the Boston history wars of the 1880s. And in all those cases, it's what you can see today and you never quite know. You see people pushing limitations on education and it could be such as in Florida, which we're talking about. It could be political. It could be the, the person doing it is solely politically motivated, wants power and doesn't really care about the issue. It could be that there's driven by religion, partly was with the Scopes trial. It could also be driven by culture ideology. And so public schools have always been sort of a shuttlecock as in a bat uh, badminton game. And one thing that always comes out is if it's politically motivated, if it's truly religiously motivated, maybe not. But if it's politically motivated, they'll always try to present it in a way that is the least, that gets everything they want so their supporters want it, but sort of mask it in other terms. I mean, we can see that right now when Lindsey Graham on a whole different issue is pushing for um, a ban on a, at federal level, changed it to a ban on abortion after 15 weeks with some exceptions. But even though he's doing that, the bill allows, would allow um, states to have more restrictive laws, such as the states that have totally banned abortion with no exceptions. Therefore, people can, if the issue comes up in a Senate campaign, they can say, oh, I support, I just support Lindsey Graham's bill, which is um, 15 weeks and um, exceptions for rape and incest and everything. That sounds reasonable to people when really that law is leaving and that is not taking away, that's not making that a national standard. Mississippi, Georgia, Wisconsin can all have more restrictive laws, but it sounds more politically attractive so that people leaning that way for other reasons can say, oh, they're not that extreme. Well, what I looked at was how each of these times, rather than cast it as, oh, we want to ban teaching evolution for religion, or we want to ban um, uh, the history books um, in the era of Boston for a cultural reason, but they always say, oh, we're just trying to defend parental rights. Parental rights is always the thing because that sounds, well, of course, we're a democracy. We should have parental rights. So that's a continuation issue. Too much as the. Well, thank you, Ed. That actually is a, a really wonderful, wonderful segue into kind of the next couple of questions I want us to take up. So where I ultimately want us to get to as an advanced planner is what do we do with this, right? Like, so we have these histories, we've written, what do we do with this? But I think before we get there, I would love to hear your thoughts on when we observe these debates, when we observe these, att observe these attacks on public education and efforts to limit academic freedom, both in terms of curriculum and individuals, um, what do we learn about the place of education 
in American society and democracy, right? Why is all of this taking place here? So whether that's a question about politics or culture or social justice, I'd love to hear your takes on how we can use this as a way to make sense of how education is being used or functioning in these broader debates. Anybody feel like starting us off? I don't want to just call on anybody cold. Oh, Karen, please. I'll start us off because I have a rather broad statement to make. And when all of this was really heating up again in 1920, uh, in, in last year, 2021, um, I uh, my head was just spinning around for a period of time. And I thought, well, let me just kind of step back and just think about some basic things about schools in the United States. And what I like to point say is the work of teachers is challenging in the best of circumstances. And we can think of a number of reasons for that. Um, but I'll just mention a couple. And one is that the schools, the public schools serve multiple functions. And some of those functions are in tension with each other. Uh, James Baldwin mentioned this in his 1963 essay, A Talk to Teachers in a beautifully uh, articulated way. Um, but basically people look to schools to serve a conservative function to preserve the status quo, to pass on the traditions and cultural and ideologies that they value. And at the same time, of course, there should be an academic function to schooling and uh, learning is all about, it requires inquiry, questioning, challenging, critiquing, and often those two things can be held in tension. And so that's always there, no matter what. Um, a second point is another obvious one probably, but that's that schools serve, public schools serve multiple constituencies, students, their families, communities, they serve the academy, they serve the economic sector and work preparation, uh, they serve the state in terms of citizenship, and you have many different um, purposes that cross purpose going on in, in that, and none of those constituencies uh, are uh, monolithic, which complicates things even further. So I just like to remind myself that teaching is hard in, in the best of circumstances, and currently we're not in the best of circumstances. Um, I would like to echo what Ed said earlier about the political push behind much of what we're seeing, uh, you know, just using schools, teachers, students um, as pawns for pretty raw political uh, ends. And so uh, we can look historically on that with LGBTQ issues when we go back to the 1950s and 60s with the very harsh, intense purge of teachers and how that played into Cold War politics. We can look in the late 1970s uh, when Politicians like John Briggs out of California use the anti-gay teacher push uh, to kind of advance his own political gain. Um, and, and I think we clearly see that now with the attack on trans youth. Uh, governors out of uh, Florida, Virginia, and other places, Texas, um, holding that up as a means really, I think, for just getting some votes. Um, yeah, thank you, Karen. Anybody else ready to hop in? Yeah, Ed, please. Sure, I, I agree with that. I mean, this can be just pure politics, that people um, can use it as a red, as a hot button issue that appeals to a certain group of voters. But it does appeal to voters because people care about what their students are taught. And some parents want to use their schools for cultural ideological purposes. As I mentioned, Horace Mann from the very beginning, one of his purposes was to, was to homogenize these immigrants. There were all these Irish immigrants moving into Massachusetts and he wanted to run them through public schools to make them Americans. Um, I wrote another book on the eugenics era and during the eugenics era, they would use the public schools to try to train people how to mate well. Um, to try to be eugenic. And so that remains true today. So people have those ulterior motives that we talked about, and they come out in public schools. And then because they have ulterior motives, it's also handy for political purposes. Yeah, I think that's such a great point, Ed. You know, one of the things that strikes me so much as I am observing what's going on right now, reading all these essays, is how the politics and psychology of fear plays into this um, as a kind of manipulation. Um, but Jana, Eddie, either of you want to hop in? Sure, sure. Um, that's, I mean, when you talk about fear, that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking when I was hearing 
um, Karen and, and Ed's talk is schools are also places where as a society, we register some of our deepest anxieties. And one of the things that I think has been really strange about these censorship battles is how deeply out of touch they seem with the actual young people I know, <laughs> and that probably many of us know, right? And I live in in the borderlands. And so, you know, um, I might know more progressive than average children um, or young people, but they're very comfortable talking about um, all kinds of sexualities and genders and um, people unlike themselves, right? In, in any kind of way. And so to be registering these kinds of, um, you know, penalties on what they're reading just seems not about the children themselves, right? And I think sometimes some of what we're talking about isn't about schools, really, or real schools. It's about schools as a concept. And it's certainly not about young people um, um, and or and even young people's well-being. I will just say like one commonality that I see um, between now and the Cold War, and I, I would be really interested in hearing other people um, talk about this too in relationship to their projects, is the particular role that young people have in political battles right now, which is to say um, cold warriors um, in McCarthyism included children, right? Their ideological development was considered as important um, and potentially dangerous um, as that of adults, which is really different, I think, than, for example, World War II. Our children were largely seen as like these um, places to collect money for the Red Cross, right? And this kind of thing. And I think we're back to a point there where we're just really obsessed with what young people um, think and how they're going to act on those thoughts, in part because um, I think you know, many of these political battles understand that they're more progressive, <laughs> I think, as a body, young people are, than um, than the generations ahead of them. Well, well let me add to that, because um, if, if we're going to talk about the Cold War and um, fear, uh, that makes me think so much about how, in my essay, I talk about how conversations about race and racial equality in the 1940s and in the 50s uh, if you talked about racial equality or fought for racial equality, you were labeled as un-American, right? You were labeled a communist, right? Um, and then we fast forward and think about how the 1619 Project has been framed and the debates around that um, in the last couple of years. Much of that is, well, you're doing something un-American. You don't love the United States. You're reframing when the country was founded. This isn't the truth, right? Um, and so you want to talk about a continuation in the role of schooling in that in the number of places that the 1619 Project has been banned, right? Or the whole concept of teaching about history and going to 1619. I mean, that's a really rich debate there. And that speak, it has echoes of the Cold War in a lot of ways, right? And then so if we want to sort of come back to the question around what do we learn about schools? I think a lot about higher education history. Uh, so that's what I do. And so I, I'm really interested in colleges and universities in a lot of ways as well. And really we what we what we learn or what we're reminded of, not necessarily what we what we're reminded of, is that the central role that colleges and universities have played in not just being part of society, but actually shaping society in a really scary way. Um, and race has been at the heart of that. And so really getting back to the essence of this question around sort of whether schooling is for sort of uh, learning and changing the way we think, or is it for maintaining the status quo? Much of history reminds us um, that universities have really been at the, at the center of really maintaining uh, so many social norms and really perpetuating many racial harms in so many ways. And that can be a question around sort of academic freedom, free speech, even federal housing policy, uh, affirmative action, uh, which is now coming up before the Supreme Court. These are so many things that remind us just how important education, broadly defined, K-12 or higher education, is at the center of what's under attack right now. And so I, I always laugh because I feel like education is the only thing that almost everyone feels like they know something about because they went to school at some point, right? I mean, no, nobody wants to weigh in on sort of medical practices or um, how other, you know, industries may work, but education, everybody's got a stake in it. And if there's something that everybody's got a stake in, uh, that tells us everything we need to know about the role of schools in American society. Yeah, yeah, that's such a great point, Eddie. You know, and it, it makes me think too about, um, 
why do we care so deeply about schools or what do they represent? And so maybe it's this larger political battle, this larger cultural battle around norms and ideals. Um, but also there's something kind of visceral as a parent, right? You know, like my kids are, are in danger. And I wonder if we could think a little bit more about how schools are being presented, right? Because I think, Jana, your point is there's what's actually happening. And then there's this kind of manufactured marketing <laughs> around what might be happening, you know? And I wonder for all of you, are these real fears or are these manufactured fears that serve very particular political, social, even economic gains, right? I think a little bit about the, the debates over choice and efforts to kind of privatize our public schools, right? Driving that seems to be this idea of fear, right? We can't trust those teachers, the government, to do what's right for us, right? And I wonder, um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on this. Anybody feel like hopping in on that? Yeah, Jana, please. And then Ed, yeah. Yeah, if I could say something about that. So, and I talk about this a little bit in my piece, right? That there's this whole fantasy slash narrative that teachers are out there teaching genderqueer, right? Or all boys aren't blue. And in fact, um, a relative few are because most don't have those books to teach them if they wanted to, right? So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why they're not teaching them, but one is of access. There's another kind of censorship that I think has been happening for longer that, um, that we need to think about too, which is a kind of administrative censorship. If we look at what testing has done to the curriculum, there are a lot of teachers I know out there who are fighting to just teach literature of any kind that's more than four pages, right? Because the curriculum has really been reduced to textbooks because there's this sense of like, we need to be test prepping all of the time. Um, I don't think most parents realize how little um, their students are reading sometimes until they get into those classes and say, my child isn't reading. I hear this all the time from parents, right? To me, that's at least as powerful as what we're seeing right now politically and legislatively. Um, and so I think that we have to think about these things in together, together when we think about um, what the real dangers in school actually are. Yeah, thank you, Jonna. And I want to turn to you, but I also want to invite everyone joining us to put questions in the Q and A. Um, we would love to to grapple with those. Um, but so, yeah. So, Ed, please hop on in. Well, well, there's certainly take for example my comparison that I made to the anti-evolution crusade, which occurred in the 20s, but then reoccurred as a creation science teaching movement in the 1980s and still happens, it helps drive the school choice movement today, that don't go to public schools because they teach evolution, go to Christian schools. In each one of those cases, yes, there was a fear that parents had that learning about evolution would um, destroy the faith of their children, that their children would be led away from Christianity. They really had that fear. Now, the question is, was it a manufactured fear? were people like William Jennings Bryan or, or others uh, more recently, um, Jerry Faldwell or whoever, promoting that to fear, how much did they really have it? How much was it manufactured? But the truth was that it worked. The people were really, some people were really scared. And you see it today in states that limit the teaching of climate change. Many states limit the teaching of climate change. Well, could that be driven by the oil companies? What's driving that concern? Um, they don't want, they are afraid that if their children learn about child climate change or their children learn about evolution, that it'll be, have adverse consequences in them in one way or another. And that helps drive this debate. And again, you, how much is schools about cultural driving? How much are the parents worried about they're losing control of their students if they go to public school. What are they going to learn there? That's everyone's mentioned that issue. And that raises the issue of how much academic freedom has there ever been in K through 12 education? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, that's a great point, Ed. You know, and I think one of the things that strikes me as we talk about this is it feels almost like 
fear is legitimate, right? Parents are like, I'm afraid for my kid. And so it's like, all right, you're afraid for your kid. But I think that when we look at these histories and we think more deeply about what is happening and what has been happening, this fear is like a euphemism for something much larger, right? Rooted in whiteness, rooted in power, right? Around race, around gender and sexuality. Um, and I, you know, and then it almost makes it more permissible, it feels like, to say, you know, I'm afraid <laughs> for my child, then to really discuss what what is happening. And I wonder how, um, I wonder the implications of that. Yeah, Ed, go ahead. And Absolutely. Then... That was the point I was trying to make, because you can't, um, it seems un-American to say, you can, on one hand, that you have to control your child. But on the other hand, it doesn't sound un-American that taxpayers and voters control public education. So that's how they massage that issue and can make this a viable sort of democratic sounding movement. Oh, let's control. We don't want our public schools undermining our children, whether it's communism or, or religion or, or, or sexual preference or any of those other issues. Um, and therefore let's control the public schools. And that's a democratic thing to do. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ed. Others of you? Yeah, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, you know, sitting with this, this idea of fear, um, you know, I, in your initial question, I, I think it can be both, right? It can be actual fear and it can be sort of manufactured actual fear, if that makes sense, right? Uh, people believe what they're afraid of, right? I, I, I'm sort of, um, you know, I, I can't help but think about sort of critical race theory and to your point around uh, what is the real fear, right? Is it is it really a matter of teaching some sophisticated legal theory uh, to people in K-12? Obviously, that's not really it, but, uh, you know, banning everything broadly under the title critical race theory, there's a fear of changing societal norms as you know it. I mean, there's a fear of potentially your children or the young people in your family could soon learn uh, a different framing of their own family history, especially if you talk about whiteness, right? And sort of like, what does it mean to be in the position that I live in this country, in this nation, right? Um, and why do my um, sort of many of my um, non-white peers uh, overall have sort of disproportionate number of this or that, right? Shouldn't they work harder, right? Sort of that thing, right? That's what, that's what this real teaching the truth about society, the teaching the truth about history, racial history is really about. And that's what people are afraid of, right? They don't want to face sort of realities around what they've come to know and accept. And they certainly don't want uh, their children to not see things the same way. And that's what fear is really doing. And that's why schools are continue to be under such attack because what learning really means. And that's something I write at the end of my essay. My, my piece is the sense of, if you really wanna be full understanding of citizenship, you have to know the truth. You have to know about the past. Yeah, thanks Eddie. I could talk about a number of these threads uh, and focus primarily on the 1950s, 60s Florida Legislative Investigation Committee, uh, which was the most intense purge of LGBTQ teachers. And the, much of that fear was manufactured. People were getting new information about sexuality and didn't quite know what that was all about. Uh, but uh, David Johnson in his book, The Lavender Scare, makes a very good case uh, that there's a lot of political manufacture of the fear that trying to link homosexuality and communism and presenting both groups as subversive, <clears throat> immoral threats to children. And so that particular um, false notion about recruiting people into a certain kind of behavior has stuck with um, um, the fear people have of LGBTQ teachers. We saw it with the Johns Committee. We saw it with the Save Our Children crusade um, and this notion of, you know, uh, well, Anita Bryant in the 1970s. We see it now in the in the text of the language of laws. Uh, Florida's Don't Say Gay Bill, for instance, suggest or when people have commented on it, they've suggested that people might be groomed into a certain kind of behavior. And so that fear just keeps resurfacing and needs to be met, uh, I think, with um, all the good knowledge that we have now, the wide range of knowledge we have about these issues uh, in that sense. And one other thought I had back to the earlier point about what's really going on in schools. 
Um, Jackie Blunt and Catherine Lug uh, a few years ago made the point that um, much of the push for getting LGBTQ issues in the curriculum or in the uh, gay straight alliances in the 1990s came from the students themselves um, because they were in a position, um, particularly in middle school and high school, where they could ask for these things, they could push for these things, and their teachers at that point still really couldn't. It was still, in most cases, a risk for the teacher to be leading in those efforts, and I think that's an important thing to, to re recall. Yeah, thank you, Karen. That is a great point. You know, I think this that is also a good segue to that sort of one of the last big questions that I'd like us to grapple with, and then we'll see where it leads us after that. But, you know, so with these histories, with these essays that you've written, with this knowledge that's that's there, what do we do with that, right? In what way might that be useful? How does that position us to, to think differently about these attacks on education or these, uh, these efforts to limit academic freedom? And I guess, who would it be useful to, <laughs> right? So I don't know if you have thoughts about that. You, you, I, yeah, I got a couple of thoughts. I, 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 um, you know, first thing, you know, how might we sort of, you know, cast a fresh light on this? What do we do with it? Um, especially when it, with regard to academic freedom, uh, something that I argue, um, especially when it considers the point of race and academic freedom, is that we've got to start thinking about academic freedom really broadly, um, even more broadly than we um, tend to think. And I think that includes a number of things around institutional structures as well, especially at the college and university level. Um, and so we've got to think about academic freedom in that sense. Um, but we also have to think about even in the moments of race and academic freedom, uh, if we don't defend that, then we don't have academic freedom at all. And so sort of thinking about other arguments around sort of limitations of academic freedom, especially to our earlier point about sort of climate change, which is huge, you know, California, right, of all places, right, where, where I'm based, right, I mean, you think about climate change, you think about, um, you know, political scientists and sort of weighing in on different things. I mean, we've got to sort of think about um, any limit on academic freedom is a limit on academic freedom in general. And so we've got to be willing to defend it um, all together. That's the first thing. And then the second thing I point that I would make about, well, who, who does this matter to and um, uh, who should be ready to take action? Uh, much of my writing is focused on college presidents and university chancellors historically and their role in shaping racial policies and practices. And I actually think a number of um, school leaders and you know, campus administrators must also understand uh, this history right, in a lot of ways. And so something that when I talk to administrators who have taken interest in my work, um, I actually speak quite a bit about the importance of them understanding the social history of their institutions, not just the institutional history. Presidents and chancellors can tell you all about the founding data or when something moved from a college to university status, this sort of institutional history, but I also tell them that those different communities that you go actively recruit from also have histories of your institution. Right. And so different communities have an understanding of what that university or that college campus means to their community. Should their children go there? Should they not go there? Is that a good place to work or not work? And it's important for administrators to understand that social history of institutions, because that's what's really at stake here. That's what's really been limited right now. Understanding of the social dynamics of history. And that's not what people want to talk about right now. The limitations on speech and limitations on academic freedom are really about sort of focusing just on sort of the mainstream, the institution, the nation itself, and not necessarily on how different populations and different people have experienced that. And so it's really essential for campus administrators to understand that, and they should have a consistent meeting with uh, local archivists, uh, just like they have a consistent meeting with vice presidents for finance and development and other aspects as well. That's great, Eddie. Yeah, thanks. Jonna, or yeah, Jonna, please. Sure. Sure. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with everything Eddie said. And I'd also like to see it go the other way around. Like we all just said in some way that the discourse about schools is out of touch with the actual work that's happening in schools. And I'm thinking particularly about what Karen's talking about. 
I would love to see um, a column in which teachers and students write together about, you know, what actually happens in their classroom and some kind of powerful op-ed series like that. Uh, the ways in which schools reach out to parents and in which the places in which parents and teachers talk to each other are, are often really circumscribed, right? And really um, um, artificial in a lot of ways, like the parent-teacher conference or the get to know your teacher night kind of thing. And those don't often give um, parents a really rich view into what happens in schools. And so I'd love to see something that helps elevate the voices of people who spend their day in schools and just educate us a little bit better about what it's really like. That's fantastic, Shauna. Yeah, Ed, please. I would, I would just add, I would reconfirm what both people have said, especially Eddie. Um, one thing that's talking about the past helps is people can see that this is not new, that it's happened before and people have gotten over it. What that in before it was somewhat real times, it was also manufactured. So you, we know the history of the past events. If we then can look at the present with the past events, we can see, oh, well, you just can't automatically believe that the politicians uh, are, are sincere or the business leaders or the ministers or whoever who are pushing this agenda. But also you can see what people did in the past, what ministers did, what scientists did, what education leaders did, what people did in the past to get over these problems before, and we can learn from that. I'd like to just kind of repeat some of the things we've been saying and, and put it this way in, in my mind. Um, I, I think it's no accident that this fierce attack on the K-12 curriculum and in higher ed has come uh, after the pandemic has been rolling along and people have been under all of the stresses of that with homes, keeping children at home for their schooling and, and so forth. And the frustration and very real distress that wasn't wrapped up in all of that, along mm -hmm. with this erosion of faith in institutions in general that we've talked about a bit already. Um, and so I think even though this is a history of assaults on academic freedom. This feels like it's a critical moment to stand up wherever we are and whatever work we do and articulate what academic freedom is about, why it is critical um, to education and to democracy. Um, and so that would be one thing. I think what might be helpful is to think about how do I communicate and make common ground across these constituencies? How do I um, come together to listen and converse with people where we're gonna be coming at from different angles perhaps, but just to show what we all have at stake together in this moment. And the point about knowing our history at every level of schooling, at every element of work that we do in the schooling. Um, earlier this year, I revisited a statement by the great educator, civil rights activist, Septima Clark in the low country of South Carolina. And she has a line, I believe unconditionally in the ability of people to respond when they are told the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think you can put aside our discussions, our philosophical discussions, if it's a big T or little T, multiple truths or singular, but I have, I believe unconditionally that people will respond when they are told the truth coming from her and her life's work and what she was able to accomplish and what she dealt with. Um, then I believe that change is possible. Uh, if Septima Clark could do it. Um, I think another key in that sentence is she doesn't say it's just going to happen. She says we have the ability to make it happen. And to nurture the ability to make something like that happen is all about how we educate ourselves, um, being educated into that capacity. And so um, that's what I'd like to add there, I guess. Thank you, Karen. Now, I see a couple of questions in the Q&A box, so maybe I'll bring one of those up now. So we have one says, as historians, what's your response to the claim that censorship is a both sides issue from the left as well as the right? Mm. Anybody feel like starting us off on that? <laughs> well, well, I think I'll people make, it. oh, go ahead. Now, of course, it can it can happen both ways. The question is, at different times, different groups. I mean, it's like apples and um, it's like weighing things. Yeah. 
where is the big issue now? Certainly, I mean, obviously on the left, you know, the Marxists did in Russia did enormous amounts of censorship. Of course, left can do it, right can do it. But just because it can happen on both sides, you've got to look at today. I mean, okay, who's doing the more censoring now? Where's the problem today? And are you really comparing equals or are you just saying, oh yeah, there's a little bit there and there's a lot there. And so it happens everywhere. That happened in the, 19, in the 2016 election. People say, well, you know, Hillary was maybe not totally honest. And so you excuse um, other things that are much bigger. I mean, you will have to look at balance and it changes at different times. You might get it worse from one end or the other. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Yeah, Jana, do you want to hop in? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's important to be sensitive to the fact that um, that these that uh, calls for censorship come from both um, liberal and conservative um, angles. I would say if we, again, use literature as just like our ur test, it's different. Um, so parents have protested Huck Finn, like all sorts of literature um, from um, from progressive points of view as well, but they're not generally arguing that they have to be taken out of the school, right? I think there's a difference between saying, I don't want my student or my child to have to read this in class, that it is, you know, um, painful to them or, or whatever reason and saying like this book cannot even be on a library shelf in the school. Those just seem like to me, two different arguments that are not the same and that we have to treat differently. Yeah, that's a great point. Eddie or Kat, Karen, did either of you want to weigh in? No, there's another question that I can, let me read here. So um, so let's see, there's some asking a specific question. So maybe some of you have expertise here. So the book banning of the 1970s and 80s to 80s was very similar to the arguments we're hearing today and resulted in a Supreme Court decision that the public school students' right to read overrode censorship. Is the Island Trees School District v. Pico decision strong enough to prevail today? You want to have thoughts on this to share? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the decisions aren't strong enough to prevail uh, necessarily. I wouldn't. I wouldn't rest on those very or tinker or any of those very solidly. I mean. Precedents are being changed all the time right now because the court's very different now than the old Warren court. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Other thoughts? Well, Jeremy, I want to loop you in too as we start to wind down with just a minute or two left. If you had thoughts you wanted to share or wanted to give you kind of the last word here as well. Uh, thanks for bringing me back, Diana. I'm just really thrilled by this discussion. It's so it's so great of all of you to be here. This is such an important topic. I mean, this really is a crucial issue of our time right now. This this question of uh, educational censorship, uh, the freedom to learn in in our schools, in our colleges, in our universities, and to have such such real intellectual firepower here. To, to help us understand it in the broader context, to help us understand how we got to where we are today and where this fits into that long story is just absolutely essential. And I, I'm so I'm so excited about this. This is what a great discussion. Thanks for thanks for all being here.